Well, it's finally out. And of course, there are going to be disagreements with it, especially if it makes you look bad. I'm talking about the RWA Independent Audit of the Ethics Policies. Now, is everything in order with the RWA? According to this, not quite. But is the RWA just a racist cesspool of, organi of an organization? Yeah, not quite. Today, we're going to do a deep dive into the audit report, take a look at the findings of the independent company which audited the ethics complaints, and um, see what we can find out for ourselves. Hope you're ready. Hi, my name is Ian Kirk Patty Cake. I am an author, robot, and I feel like there's more there, but whatever. We're going to just jump right into this. So if you've been following along the saga, I have done a couple videos covering the RWA the implosion of the RWA, however we want to call this, since December when I did my first video, which you can see if you click the link on above. I'm also going to link some at the end of this video if you want to check out all of the information that I have uncovered. At this point in time, I am still blocked by Courtney Milan. I've never talked to Courtney Milan. I was, I can only assume I was blocked by her after I was asking questions on December 24th about what was going on. Because I made a couple people mad that day just asking what was going on and then not agreeing that everything was just racist. But, okay. So, I don't have any... I, if there are any questions or disagreements in these notes, I can't clarify with her because she won't even let me see her, her Twitter account. But, okay. My hair is just not looking good right now. I don't know. Before we jump into the audit itself, I want to take one more look here at the Claire Ryan uh, calendar of events because there have been a couple updates. As you may or may not have known, on February 18th, the Independent Ethics Audit Report was released by Pillsbury Winthrop, Shaw, Pittman, LLP. And so that's actually, obviously, that's what we're going to go over today. Of course, you couldn't have the release of the audit without having Courtney Milan arguing with the findings of it. She's actually got a lot of... Um, notes in this whole thing of events that is her saying oh no you're wrong i'm right whatever whatever so so she disagrees obviously with the findings of the report and i can't say that the report looks great for her so i don't blame her for um disagreeing with the report but just because you look bad doesn't mean that it's wrong sometimes it's just you and i would even argue that part portions of courtney milan quotes in the report um suggest that she she doesn't just look bad because of the report. She just is bad. Following that, we've got a couple <sighs> complaints from Courtney Milan, which she's been doing this whole time. You've got extensive, this says extensive discussion ensues over the audit of the, the, the audit report. And it just leads you to Twitter with all of these people. I would not, I would say don't read that with any seriousness because there is no seriousness to be had in Twitter discussions generally. I mean, just yesterday I saw some conversation that was about authors should be able to write, you know, whatever they want to write. It's about their books and there are people going in there. Well, yeah, they should, but if you write something bad, get ready to take the consequences of writing something bad. A bad book review is different than trying to cancel an author because you don't like what they write or they wrote a character that you deem problematic. Like, we should not even be having to have discussions that people shouldn't be canceled because you don't like the type of character they write. But here we are. It's defended as the consequences of your actions. Okay. So just Twitter is a cesspool. We've discussed this a couple of times. And then on February 22nd, which is a week away, is a week ago now, Rachel Grant, former member of the original RWA Ethics Committee, points out that the board were not aware that the ethics report did not come from the original Ethics Committee. With that said, there is a lot of content to get through here with the ethics report, so let's get started. As I mentioned, it was an ethics report done by Pillsbury, is the name of the group, that you've got the email, or you've got... <clears throat> You've got the web address down here at the bottom of the page, and I will also leave a link to this report 
in the comments. So if you'd like to read it over for yourself, you may do so. We've got a times table. We're not going to read everything in this document because that would take a lot of time with it being 56, but we're going to read over some of the, the main stuff that really builds this situation. So executive summary, Pillsbury, Winthrop, Shaw, Pittman, LLP conducted an independent ethics audit of the Romance Writers of America with the focus on RWA's handling of two ethics complaints that were filed against then member Courtney Milan. Pillsbury reviewed extensive documentation in connection with the audit and conducted interviews with and obtained written statements from participants. Pillsbury's findings are set out in detail in this report. The key conclusions of the audit include Number one, RWA members do not have a commonly shared understanding of provisions and reach of the members' code of ethics, nor did those charged with investigating or enforcing allegations of code violations. Two, RWA's code provisions and ethics complaints procedures have been frequently modified by RWA's board in ad hoc fashion without legal review, resulting in ambiguous and con inconsistent provisions and variable approaches to addressing ethics complaints. Three, the ethics committee recommendation of a finding against Ms. Milan was based on its interpretation of concepts that are undefined in RWA's policy and the Ethics Committee's report to the board did not adequately explain the rationale for its recommendation or the evidence supporting that recommendation. Four, the RWA board was not provided the evidence against Ms. Milan or her responses to the ethics complaints against her. The board failed to treat the Ethics Committee as an advisory committee and contrary to the RWA's policies in effect delegated its finding its fact finding authority to the ethics committee the board voted to find miss milan in violation of code despite the expressed concerns of board members that the board lacked a sufficient understanding of the rationale for the committee's recommendation or the evidentiary foundation for that recommendation and five the Evidence Pillsbury reviewed does not suggest that the evident finding against Miss Milan was motivated by animus or bias against her. Rather, the outcome here results from deficiencies in RWA's policies and procedures, a failure to seek legal counsel when needed, and inadequate understanding by board members of their roles and obligations under RWA's governance structure. Consistent with Pillsbury's charge, the report concludes with specific recommendations and options for modification to RWA's members' code of ethics and enforcement procedures. So if anybody comes at you, or the spe especially on Twitter, because that's where all of this racial stuff is charged, and says that this whole thing is racist, it's not. It's conducted by somebody on the outside. Their, their whole thing was to do a review from outsiders who have no idea what was going on, look at the information, listen to people, and see what they could piece together based on different accounts from different people you know they would find who is and is not lying of course if you look bad you're always going to say that it's a lie so keep that in mind when you listen to different people when you listen to the different um stories from different people that said i'm also looking at it from an outsider so you you know you get what you get nobody wants if you don't want to talk to me i just get a look at vitriol and anger and i'm sorry as an outsider looking at courtney milan's uh, Twitter page, she just seems, seems angry and bitter and like she's got a bone to pick and she's got a, what's the word that I want? A, an agenda. She's got an agenda and she will use the, the, the slur of racist to do that. For the scope of the ethics audit, because I saw somebody in the comments talking about, well, this isn't looking at previous claims. Yeah, because the scope is not big to do forever and always. So what is the scope? Pillsbury was retained by RWA on January 3rd, 2020 to conduct an independent ethics audit of RWA's handlings of the two ethics complaints that were filed against Courtney Milan in August and September of 2019. So if anybody complains that, well, you didn't look into the, uh, into the issues before that, well, no, because they weren't hired for that scope. Okay, understand that when you hire for something specific, that is what they're going to do, not beyond that scope. The RWA board has taken action on those complaints in two executive session meetings in December 2019. In a December 17th meeting, the board voted to accept an ethics committee finding that Ms. Milan had violated the RWA Code of Ethics and to impose sanctions. On December 24th, 2019, the board rescinded that vote. Pillsbury is not RWA's regular corporate counsel and has not previously advised RWA with respect to its policies and procedures or the handling of its ethic matters. 
Pillsbury was engaged by RWA on January 3, 2020, with a charge to investigate and review the facts relating to the handling of the complaints against Ms. Milan and to report our findings. In addition, we were asked to make recommendations for changes to RWA's policies, procedures, and practices. We conducted this audit without preconceptions with the instructions that our findings should be reported without regard to whether they reflected favorably or unfavorably on the RWA, and with the understanding that this report would be shared with RWA membership. Although RWA set the scope of the engagement, Pillsbury was given full independence in the conduct of the audit within that scope. RWA provided all documents we requested over the course of the audit. Because of the cost implications for the audit, we saw approval prior to proceedings, with including interviews within our activities, and again sought approval to expand the number of interviews we conducted beyond our initial proposal to interview a small set of individuals. The RWA board authorized those expansions, and RWA did not direct Pillsbury selections of interviewees. Over the period of January and the first week of February 2020, we conducted interviews with and or were provided written statements by 21 individuals who had a role in the events at issue. We also invited every person interviewed and all participants in the RWA board meeting on December 17th and December 24th of 2019 to provide any documentation that the individuals considered relevant to Pillsbury's review of those events. Every individual interviewed or who submitted statements had been fully cooperative in responding to Pillsbury's questions and requests for information. The audit included interviews with and or written statements and documents from Susan Tisdale, Catherine Lynn Davis, Courtney Milan, Chair of Ethics Committee panel that reviewed the complaints against Courtney Milan, Allison Kelly, Carol Ritter, Helen K. Diamond, Carol, Carolyn Jewell, Damon Swade, Nan Dixon, Kate McMurray, Donna Alward, Denny Bryce, Pintip Dunn, Ceresia Glass, Tracy Livesay, Adrian Michelle, Priscilla Olivares, Erica Ridley, Farah Rockin, and Renee Ryan. Pillsbury was not charged with offering a definitive interpretation of the submitted... Hmm. Pillsbury was not charged with offering a definitive interpretation of the substantive provisions of RWA's member code of ethics, and we make no determination as to the merits of the ethics complaints against Ms. Milan. RWA's code of ethics provisions prohibited conduct injurious to RWA or its purposes is in is amiable to different interpretations. Under one reasonable interpretation, Ms. Milan conducted... Mm. Under one reasonable interpretation, Ms. Milan's conduct, as reflected in the materials contained in the two complaints against her and in her responses, were permissible under the code. Under a different and also reasonable interpretation, Ms. Milan's conduct might be considered to violate that provision. The board's findings of the violation against Ms. Milan on December 17th, however, was made without a review of that evidence and in multiple respects was not in accordance with RWA's own policies and procedures. Moreover, Pillsbury's interviews indicate that the board would not have found Ms. Milan's conduct to be in violation of the code if the board had reviewed the full evidence. For this reason, we characterize the findings against Ms. Milan on December 17th as unjustified outcome. In the next two sections of the report, we provide an account of what led to the that outcome and we identify what went wrong so first off according to the independent audit the findings from the the um, meeting on December 17th were unjustified because the information in the code of conduct contradicts itself and also is kind of vague at times and so that makes it difficult to classify one of the things that I get the feeling of and I'm you know, obviously just speculating from the outside, had nothing to do with it, figured, you know, came into the situation after the fact, is that I think because tensions were so high when this was happening and it had been happening for months, that people were getting freaked out. People were worried about the organization. They wanted to end this as quickly as possible and thus shortcutted the everything that was going on. Like, they didn't do the complainants any good favors, and they didn't do Courtney Milan any favors, and neither were helping the situation. And they wanted to just get this done and over with, and so they didn't follow procedures because they really didn't have procedures to stop this from happening. And as we're going to get into, it looks like Courtney has been a problem in this group for a while. So I'm going to, going to, going to guess, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, 
that that has something to do with all of this tension and wanting to just shush it up as quickly as possible because she's been a problem for a while and there really was no quick fix to it. But that's really all they wanted. If you look at a lot of these commenters, even on Twitter, they'll tell you, well, I have books that I want to be writing. Everybody just wants to be writing books, but also certain people want to be in power. Someone a little bit of both. Getting back to the audit, what occurred, for the most part, a fairly consistent account of what occurred has emerged from the documentation and information provided by individuals who participated in the events. The findings described below derive either from definitive documentation or from information provided by one or more participants. Where the accounts of the participants conflicted in any material respect, we note for inconsistencies. Background on RWA's Code of Ethics. At the time Susan Tisdale and Catherine Lynn Davis filed their ethics complaints against Courtney Milan, RWA was operating with a member code of ethics and with ethics complaints procedures that several participants described as hodgepodge. According to former executive director Allison Kelly, who had served in the role of RWA from 1995 through October 2019, the code of ethics has undergone many revisions over the years. In, 20, in 2003, the code was revised by RWA's corporate counselor and completely rewritten to have very limited scope. The code prohibited, quote, engaging in conduct injurious to RWA or its purposes, end quote, but did not include any of the current provisions that govern member-to-member -member conduct. Since that time, and especially frequently since 2014, provisions were gradually added to the code and changes were made to the related procedures in piecemeal fashion. Motions were included on the agenda of nearly every board meeting in the past five years to introduce amendments revising the policies and procedures. These motions were drafted without requesting outside legal review of the amendments or legal advice of the revision process. The motions themselves were often further revised during the board meetings, which were not attended by RWA corporate counsel. Helen K. Diamond, who served on the board from November 1, 2014 until August 31, 2019, authored almost all of the motions proposing revisions to the code and related procedures. She has described the incremental revisions as a band-aid approach to resolving conflict between code provisions and adding clarity to sections of the code. So it seems like more work needed to be done on the code of ethics than was actually done. Nobody really likes to do the legal work, generally. <laughs> In January 2016, promptly in January 2016, prompted by vocal concerns from the membership about what the board described as a difference in opinion regarding a column from a well-known reviewer on the subject of diversity and members of RWA who did not agree with the reviewer's treatment of the subject, the board approved the statement to the membership on application of the Code of Ethics to such controversies. The board's statement declared Members of RWA Board of Directors are entitled as individuals to voice their opinions on any issue as, in, as is every member of RWA. Board members are not silenced simply because they sit on the board. RWA is a professional organization dedicated to furthering the professional interest of romance writers. While many of us have strong friendships with fellow members, RWA is not a social club. As always, RWA encourages open dialogue among members. Differences of opinion are welcome and encouraged. It is not the organization's job or desire to monitor and or comment on tone, content, or opinion unless it is found to be in violation of the code of ethics. That makes it very difficult when a lot of criticism, specifically when it comes through on Twitter, happens to be just calling people racist, calling people trash, calling people a Nazi, and going to the most extreme case of anything that you possibly can. There is very much a difference between this book isn't good or I didn't like this book and then blah 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 reasons and what a racist piece of trash blah or this person like with what Courtney Milan did accusing Sue Grimshaw of being a racist when she worked at Borders when she had no control everybody is so ready to just emotionally engage at a 20 on a meter of 10 that it's not just opinions or tone or content. You've got, literally got people saying burn stuff down or kill people on Twitter. And that's considered opinion. It, you have to decide what is approvable behavior or not. I'm currently in a writing organization that's in the early phases of it. And I was just invited onto the board. And one of the things that we 
um, have going on in our organization is there is one member that comes around every now and then and when it's time to critique his pieces you know we'll sit there read the pieces and then critique them he will not sit in a cone of silence when you give him his critique and he will fight you over it he will become very argumentative he will talk over you and then he will talk in circles for like 15 20 minutes to tell you how whatever it is you just critiqued is wrong now we can say we're not we're not into stomping over the creativity of authors and we're not there to you know direct tone or content or opinion on stuff but if we say that authors are not allowed to speak or become ar argumentative when they are being given feedback, that is separate from trying to say you're not allowed to have an opinion as an author. You have to decide what is an appropriate response and what is not. And then you can leave it vague outside of that. But you have to put direct rules that people can't follow, which includes using your sway on social media to gang up on somebody whom you don't like, which has happened. We shouldn't, considering this, they've been saying they've been doing revisions since 2014 at the very least. We have seen people get ganged up on in science, sci-fi and fantasy. We've seen people get ganged up on in the YA industry from just Twitter mobs, not even like real people, but just Twitter mobs going after people because now you can get someone canceled by throwing a fit on Twitter because people get scared that there is power in knowing that you can do that to somebody. Look at what happened to Sue Grimshaw after they came for her. She got fired because people on Twitter realized that if they powwow enough of their people together, they can gang up on somebody and get real life consequences. One of the things that the RWA needs to decide in its true rules is, is that kind of behavior allowable? And if somebody in your organization decides they don't like somebody else in your organization, can they have that opinion of, one, I don't like this person, and two, can I ruin their life? Is somebody in the organization allowed to lie about somebody else who is or is not in the organization? Is the line drawn at, well, if the person is not in the organization, then they don't have any protection from us, so members of the organization are free to gather together and then go after somebody who doesn't belong at this? Because that's still going to reflect on your organization. And mind you, that this chasing after Sue Grimshaw, Susan Tisdale, and Catherine Lynn Davis all happened while Courtney Milan was on the ethics committee. So it's apparently ethical behavior to trash talk somebody on Twitter to all of your people and form a mob to get them fired and get them kicked out of a professional career. It's apparently professional behavior that's not against the RWA rules to target a small press that you don't that you don't think is is being run the way you would like to run it. Apparently those are all endorsed behaviors because the RWA doesn't want to police tone content or opinion. There needs to be a line of what is acceptable professional behavior. And with Twitter, the lines bl blur between what is acceptable and what is not. And then a lot of people just take a hands-off approach. And really, really, the secret is they don't want the the err to come at them next. They see the threats and they don't want that to come on them. The RWA board created a social media task force, which reported at the board's November 2016 meeting and its recommendations for RWA's development of policies on social media. The tax task force recommended that less restriction on speech is better, short of best judgment, use tact, behave professionally, etc., and forbid forbidding any kind of harassment, discrimination, etc., against RWA or individual members, as set forth in RWA's policy. There's not much more RWA should require, which, you know, that is saying that RWA members can harass and discriminate against people who are not RWA members. So say somebody was a member and then stopped being a member because of whatever, you know, politics going on inside. And so, well, these people know that you can go after somebody who's not a member and it's not against the rules. Hmm. 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 Codifying that stance, the board amended the code at its March 2017 meeting, adopting by general consent a motion to incorporate a new prohibition that included an exception for social media, quote, to the extent not otherwise addressed above repeatedly or intentionally engaging in conduct with the intent of harming a member's career, reputation, or well-being specifically excluded from this section are exchanges of business information, true statements, personal disagreements, and honest discussions of books, social media posts, and marketing materials, end quote. I would think that 
boy, this is a racist mess. And oh my gosh, did you know that you have a racist working with you are um, not statements of fact, but they are intentionally made with intentionally made with the intent of harming a member's career reputation or well-being. I would argue that. In June 14th, 2019 email, Allison Kelly, then direct and then executive director, sent a memo to then President Helen K. Diamond and then President elect Carolyn Jewell expressing her concern that RWA has problems because it now has multiple policies that govern behavior. Miss Kelly listed RWA's code of ethics for members, forum rules, chapter code of conduct, rules pertaining to RITA award judges, and non-discrimination membership policies. Miss Kelly wrote, members are likely not aware of all of them and the policies themselves are not consistent. Complaints are increasing and usually elegy uh, and usually alleged discrimination based on racism. The board has charged staff with reviewing complaints to determine if they could be escalated to the ethics committee. I actually have what I think is a good plan that will guide members through a complaint process to determine via questions that they answer if the complaint rises to the level that this, that disciplinary action is warranted. However, before that can be implemented, the board must rectify the organization's multiple and conflicting codes. In my opinion, we are on thin ice in this situation and we need to tread carefully until all policies and related discipline are consistently written and applied and i would agree with that if you had stuff that's kind of hodgepodge put together over um many decades of time you should always err on the side of making your rules more concise and not simply adding on to them. So if you're going to add a new rule, I would go with remove two more, just or remove at least one, depending on how many rules you have, to make sure that you're constantly upgrading and you're not like adding rules in that are already there or that contradict old rules. And it's not a lot of fun to go over old rules, but you need to do it so you don't end up with confusing policies that people have no idea are going on. Think of how many dumb laws we have in different states right now because nobody goes through the books to clean up what's not necessary anymore. Ms. Kelly also shared these concerns with the board at its July 2019 meeting. At that meeting, the board adopted a motion that Ms. Diamond to amend numerous provisions in the member code of ethics, including revisions that prohibition on, quote, engaging in conduct that with the intent of harming members' careers, reputations, or well-beings to exclude non-RWA-operated social media posts rather than all social media posts. So that sounds like it was changed specifically so that personal accounts could be used to gang up and harass on people. I don't know why you would need to do that, but that was done by Miss Helen Kay over here, who was also involved in the hijacking of the Ritas, I think was mentioned in a previous video. In addition, the board voted to add a provision prohibiting a, quote, violation of the anti-discrimination policy as set out in Section 161 of the board policy manual. That provision, which had not previously been incorporated into the Code of Ethics, that thus had been outside the jurisdiction of the Ethics Committee, provides in part that in order to create a safe and respectful environment, invidious discrimination is prohibited in RWA. The term invidious discrimination is not defined. It should be defined. So that was a problem. The remainder of Section 6.1 prohibits members participating in RWA activities and users of RWA forums and social media accounts from discriminating against other members, participants, and users based on race, color, ethnicity, national origin, age, gender, gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation, disability, physical appearance, body size, or religion. What a mouthful. Section 6.1 also prohibits denial of RWA membership to adults based on any of the listed protected class stat, uh, group statuses. No formal ethics complaints were filed under the under either of those provisions of the code until the filings of the Ms. T of until the filings of the Tisdale and Davis complaints against Courtly Milan. According to Ms. Diamond, most of the formal code of ethics complaints that RWA had received in recent years related to plagiarism allegations. At its October 5th, 2019 board meeting, the board approved a motion by then-President Carolyn Jewell to create a task force to present the board with a report of recommended updates to the Policies and Procedures Manual section, including, but not limited to, accountability of members and chapters to ensure that P&PM is, is intentionally consistent 
and in line with the recommendations of RWA's legal counsel. Ms. Jewell appointed Ms. Diamond the previous president to the chair of task force. The task force had not developed any recommendations by December 2019 when the RWA board issued divisions of the ethics complaints against Ms. Milan. And scrolling down here to the events prior to the filing of Ms. Tisdale and Davis complaints. Number one, Courtney Milan's role in the RWA. Courtney Milan served for four years as a director on the RWA board from November 1, 2014 to October 31, 2018. During her time on the board, she sought to address RWA's challenges with diversity, equity, and inclusion of authors of color, gay and lesbian authors, and other marginalized groups, and she focused on the board's attention on changing needed to support and she focused the board's attention on changes needed to support diverse authors. That doesn't seem fair to me because you're giving certain people more attention based on protected classes. That's not treating everybody as equal as we can see immediately from Courtney's involvement. She went in with a with an agenda. For example, Ms. Milan brought a motion to establish a conference harassment policy and she was a driving force behind RWA's ensuance of a public apology in April of 2016 for a 2005 survey that asked RWA members to vote on whether romance should be redefined to include only relationships between one man and one woman. That is so out of line to me, and I don't care what you believe in now. I don't care what you believed in 2005. It is so out of line to go back in time and hold anybody accountable to things that you believe now. You know, even 2008 Obama did not believe in same-sex marriage. It is completely respectable, is that the word that I want? Normal to ask people if, if it's okay as an organization, if we progress forward, if we change things, if we establish new normals. And that's what is happening. That's what was happening in 2005 with that survey as they were acknowledging those, the board members saying this is what is normal. And this is what our group, this is what our association recognizes. Should we push this forward? Rather than forcing it forward, they're asking the basically constituents, you know, the members of the group, if it is okay to tr to do this other thing to push forward things change life right now is no is so different than it was 15 years ago 20 years ago 30 years ago things change and there's no reason to go back and apologize and to me this just reads as courtney milan virtue signaling for extra points for something that doesn't matter and something she was not involved with and she just wants another point to try to shame the rwa with there's nothing wrong here they've moved on clearly Ms. Milan also maintained an active social media presence, which had included comments critical of RWA. According to Carol Ritter, when Ms. Milan joined RWA board in November of 2014, she agreed to tamp down her public critiques of RWA. Ms. Milan also recused herself from the board votes on matters she had publicly criticized prior to joining the board. After her board service ended, she resumed social media criticisms of RWA decisions. So this sounds like she was hounding the organization prior, and in some ways, of go in some ways with it saying she was hounding the organization then she was offered this position if she you know lightened the load of criticisms it kind of sounds like appeasement because this person was out there making a bunch of noise to make them look bad and so she was like yeah okay and then once she was done she went back straight back to trash talking them it sounds it doesn't sound good <laughs> it sounds a little bit um underhanded it sounds a little bit almost blackmail-y like if you don't do what I want then I'm going to tell all the people you suck but I I'm going to tell all the people that you cheated on your husband but I didn't cheat on my husband it doesn't matter I have 30,000 followers baby and what I say they're going to believe that's what this feels like okay okay we'll give you a position just please don't okay but then when the loyalties are down, you know, you go back out. So she's got nothing to lose. She either takes control of the organization herself or she trashes the organization through the large number of followers that she has. It's a win-win situation. But if you have a different understanding of that situation, let me know. All I have is the uh, information, is the interpretation that I can give. Shortly before the expiration of Miss Milan's second term on the board, Helen K. D Diamond... I don't know why I trip on that name every time, who was about to start her term as president asked Ms. Milan whether she would agree to serve as chair of the ethics committee in an October. Oh, look. Oh, look.
Funny how they're all always tied together, isn't it? Isn't it? In an October 14, 2018 email, Miss Diamond wrote, quote, Under the new system, you will have a pool of people to draw from for each matter and oversee the group that hears any complaint. I think of this role sort of like the person who makes sure all the trains keep running. This is new, and with the chapter code of conduct and the clarity we added in the ethics codes, it's possible the committee will be used more than it currently is and for matters that really are member disagreements and not ethics issues. The ethics chair name is not included on the findings and reports as you know hmm hmm we're gonna come back to that in a second as you know the committee makes a recommendation and then the board must vote the matter is presented to the parties as the board's decision your work and who is on individual cases will remain confidential so she wants to put Courtney Milan in this role where Courtney gets to decide which ethics complaints actually go to the ethics boards and which don't. And nobody knows that anyone is actually making that decision. Somebody is just kind of making it in shadow which, which cases to dismiss. That seems a little buggy. Miss Milan replied stating that she was willing to accept the appointment, but, she, but that she would understand if this was something that you or the board balk at. She says, quote, the only reason I angsted about it for a little bit is that I'm worried that because Courtney Milan is mean, someone will file an ethics complaint against me, and that will complicate things a bit. Miss Diamond assured Miss Milan that she was exactly the right person for the role. It's kind of funny that you've got here Allison Kelly is being praised as somebody who's recognized um, Courtney Milan's contributions and the direction and focus on diversity. But then you go over to that Kate Elan post saying that Allison Kelly only cares about white women. And it kind of just plays to the idea that there is no such thing as appeasement for these people. You can bow to literally everything they ask you to do and it will never be enough because everything will be used over you as a chance to blackmail. At the November 2018 board meeting, the board approved Ms. Milan's appointment as Ethics Committee Chair. As Ethics Committee Chair, Ms. Milan oversaw and re the review of one ethics complaint. So now we get to what really caused the issue, and that is the social media storm, and it is what proves that Twitter is the devil. Don't take it seriously. In the final two weeks of Ms. Diamond's term as president of the RWA board, Ms. Diamond shared her thoughts on RWA's code of ethics approach to members' social media posts in an email to her successor, Carolyn Jewell, the successor, president-elect Damon Swade, retiring executive director Allison Kelly, and the successor, elective director Carol Ritter. On Friday, August 16th, 2019, Miss Diamond wrote, quote, I just wanted to bring up a few things because while I hate when our members misbehave on social media and I get that other members see it and it causes a problem, I'm concerned about what the parameters would look like if the social media exception is taken off. Members have different levels of tolerance on what is okay and not okay. And interrupting this for a second, you usually see this intolerance only going one way, and it's for the most minute of things, as we'll get into here. Most important, we continue with... <laughs> We continue with Ms. Diamond's statements. Most importantly, we need some sort of standard for the Ethics Committee to apply to make their de determinations. It is, one in, it is one instance. Is it one instance? Is it subjective? Is it an ordinary person would find discriminatory, etc.? There isn't any guidance right now, and I see the potential for an issue to blow up and be very messy because everyone comes at this from a very personal place. The potential for accidental, unequal application of the ethics rules seems pretty big. That same day, Miss Milan posted a series of tweets about Sue Grimsh. Hmm. Hmm. That's very interesting that somebody, Miss Diamond, who I'm who, who has come off in these, you know, researchings as a friend or ally to Miss Milan. It's interesting that she would say we need to we need to look at these policies and what they actually mean, and also not punish people for what they say on their you know personal accounts. Same day that Courtney Milan starts going after somebody on her personal account. Very interesting timing. 
Same day, Miss Milan posted a series of tweets about Sue Grimshaw, whom she described as having worked as the romance buyer for Borders, capable of making romance novelists' career by putting their work front and center around the country. Miss Milan characterized her tweets as in response to someone going around Romance Landia right now, arguing with people who have been calling out a major industry player who liked tweets that fell somewhere on the range between yikes racist and actual white supremacist. Mind you, those tweets were just liking some Donald Trump tweets, liking some Charlie Kirk tweets, liking some Diamond and Silk, you know, just liking general, popular, mainstream personalities and the president. But, you know, that counts as apparently the Ike's racist. This is not, those should be considered for ethical complaints because she's saying you're not allowed to, uh, to um, support the president who was elected or else you fall immediately into white supremacist zone. How is that tolerant? Why are they the ones making the rule? Tell me how that makes any sense. Miss Milan wrote, Sue Grimshaw had the ability to break someone's career by not buying the book at all. Uh, citation needed, by the way. We don't know. We don't know. But for decades, black romance authors heard there were no market for their work. But we heard that in the time period when one of the major bookstores was being headed by a person where we now have serious doubts as to whether that they could review their work. Again, citations needed. You need to show me what your evidence is. I'm assuming that she's assuming that because Sue Grimshaw liked some Trump tweets that all of this fantasy in her head is true because there's no anything for this. It's just Milan talking. If you were not in Borders, you would not have a career. And this anecdote actually tells you a lot about what systemic power plus prejudice can do. It can change the course of an entire industry to the detriment of authors around us. So when people are mad about this, this isn't a small thing. This isn't getting on someone's case about not being woke enough. I do think this is not a thing that can go by without some kind of reckoning. And I didn't say anything for a while because I didn't know what kind of reckoning would suffice. And I still don't. But I think we need to have a, that conversation as a community. This isn't okay. This person has potentially done systemic harm. What now? There is so much questionable about this statement from Courtney Milan. She's making an accusation about somebody with no evidence, no references, no nothing. She just pulled it out her butt. I could say the same thing about her with no references at all. Just go on and start shitposting about the terrible kind of person that Courtney Milan is and how she has hurt people in the past. And clearly, clearly she needs to be punished. And that's what the, the second half of this is all about. So first she makes her claims against Sue Grimshaw. Then the second whole thing of this is there needs to be punishment for what for the accusations I just made against this person. Let's have a public discussion on how we should treat this woman because of what I've said about her. This is a threat against an individual. On the same day that Helen that Helen K. Diamond said, well, should we really punish people for what they say on their private Twitter account? This is a threat. She's calling a mob together with her 30,000, almost 40,000 followers or whatever it is now to go against one person based on the claims she has made with no evidence for any of it. That is dangerous. How can the RWA, how can anybody see this and be like, eh, she's right. We shouldn't do anything. Don't want to, you know, impede on somebody's opinion. On Monday morning, August 19th, 2019, Miss Kelly referenced Miss Milan's tweets in her response to Miss Diamond about the social media exception in RWA's Code of Ethics. Quote, I don't know if you've heard, but apparently Courtney attacked Sue Grimshaw on Twitter this weekend and Sue lost her job. Courtney also alluded to the fact that RWA might take action against Sue. I am posting this update to HK's thread because it may make a difference as to how the board will move forward or not. And for reference... Here is the tweet posted August 16th, 2019, with Courtney Milan saying, Hey, here's one tiny piece, place to start. Sue Grimshaw is, I believe, an RWA member as an industry professional. There is a code of ethics for industry professionals that includes a non-discrimination clause. If you're an author of color slash were writing characters of color and you were rejected by Sue Grimshaw, particularly with rejection letters that made you say, hmm, and if we have enough of these, they may be enough to act. So here she is making a calling card for an attack. Doubly, let's take a look at this original tweet from Liz Lincoln, who was going after Sue Grimshaw's employer. 
and calling on if the R if the RWA can punish Sue Grimshaw's employer if they don't take action against Sue. So this is everybody trying to mobilize, all of these same people trying to mobilize to direct punishment upon whom they have deemed enemies without any sort of evidence for what they are claiming. These are the weakest responses I've ever seen. I don't have a rejection letter because she refused to read materials my former agent pitched to her. I'm, that happens to a lot of people. Some agents just aren't interested in what you're pitching. Mine are very generic, and I don't think that it'll be any help. Yeah, because generally everything is generic. Like, there's nothing. Everybody gets rejected by agents, by acquisition agents, by publishers. Everybody gets rejected. And this is trying to make an issue out of a non-issue that everybody goes through. I've seen it before. Harry Potter received a ton of rejections. Everybody receives a ton of rejections, be it this... And it can be personal. Oh my gosh. A lot of the responses that I've received that were actually that were actual responses and not, you know, being completely blown off <laughs> were agents saying this story doesn't speak to me on a personal level. That is a generic response. So even that isn't a good enough answer for you to call discrimination and racism. So after Courtney Milan um, was leading the charge on can we punish Sue Grimshaw in the RWA and can we punish Mary Force in the RWA, Sue Grimshaw is not a, was not a member at this time. The non-discrimination clause was recent was only recently added, so it wouldn't apply to the past actions by industry professionals. Sue is no longer acquiring. How does this help the RWA or its members? I seriously don't know. Miss Jewell responded, So, disclosure, some days prior to Courtney naming names, I subtweeted that I had found Sue's liked tweets and was horrified and blocked the account. I did not name her except in private DMs to people who asked. That includes Helen Kay, who agreed Sue should never, ever judge at, RW, at RWA contests. So part of me says Courtney pointed out the truth, but I do not have those tweets in front of me to say anything about the totality of what, I'd, what she'd said. There were a lot of people discussing this. I'm only discussing what I know and said not taking a position. Sue's account prior to her sanitizing it supported anti-semitic racist tweets again it was just trump tweets charlie kirk tweets i think there were i think i saw some tucker carlson tweets diamond and silk tweets and this response from carolyn uh jewel it should also horrify people this is really i think where the breakdown in um the power structure in rwa is they are saying they are going to discriminate against Sue Grimshaw because of her political beliefs. They are immediately saying she is going to hold a bias against people because she voted for Trump, so she should never be in a position of power, while completely ignoring the fact that Carolyn Jewell, Courtney Milan, and Helen Kay are all misusing their power. You've also got a situation here where Carolyn said that, that she was privately talking to other members in power, including Helen Kay, who was friends with Co Courtney Milan, and named who she was talking about, and then shortly after that, Courtney spilled it. So they're playing telephone, sharing private information, and then ousting people whom they don't like. That is a gross misuse of power. Mr. Swade replied soon after, quote, I don't think what you're describing is an issue, Carolyn. I think I did much much the same via subtweet and private convo. Sue's tweets have been screenshotted. There's, sample evi there's ample evidence and the community seems widely aware of her history. She's been called out by name for behavior that would get her banned from conference. So just, so just liking Trump tweets is enough to get you banned from the RWA conference? Hmm. This sounds like it's a pack, guys. It might be too late for the RWA. It might be time to start something fresh that's not infiltrated by political activists. If that's enough to get you uninvited from the conference, like, what hope is there? Not to be a downer, but... He continues, I see this as a big problem with RWA waiting into social media police role. It should be something we can enforce with all our members, basic tolerance, unbiased professional behavior, but historically, we have no precedent. tolerance and unbiased behavior as they talk about treating somebody differently for liking Trump tweets. 
Ultimately, he says, though I suspect the lawyers will be more cautious, I bet Courtney and co. can make a pretty watertight case against Grimshaw for problematic discriminatory behavior in public with ugly receipts and zero self-awareness, but Grimshaw and others are the most likely to pipe up with members were mean to me on Twitter and I wasn't marching in clan robes, so all of this is hearsay. How do we navigate that honestly and properly? I like how he immediately... So these people have ousted Damon Swade, by the way. It doesn't matter that he was on their side. It doesn't matter that you have all this. It doesn't matter that he's associating Sue Grimshaw liking Trump tweets to, well, she wasn't marching in a Klan robe, so it's not quite as racist. So you've got Damon on this. But they all hate Damon, too. They all wanted him to resign, and uh, at this point he has resigned as well. Because there is no... There's no pleasing these people. It's not what they're after. They're after the power, and they're after getting rid of you. <laughs> Just look at this. And they go, well, this person is racist and biased. However, however, there's, there's no self-awareness here. And I don't see how Courtney Milan has a case against this. She's literally calling for mobs against people where she has zero evidence and in that tweet where she was looking for evidence she was just asking people for their rejection letters you can't prove anything with a rejection letter i can't imagine any any agent even if they were some kind of extremist straight up telling you no we're not gonna like i can't even imagine courtney milan sending a letter if she were an acquisition agent saying no we're not gonna publish you because you're a white bigot because that's discrimination. She knows that's discrimination against the law. She's a lawyer. He continues, what I'm imagining is sort of kaiju conflict playing out symbolically via our evolving COE. On one side, free speech from the apparent racists, and on the other side, obvious bias from the outraged folks. Who know what our bylaws say about discrimination? It's a legitimate conflict. RWA must advance the careers of professional romance authors fairly, but also well not Tol but will not tolerate discrimination by its members. Core question, how much is RWA implicated in racist behavior by industry professionals? How far can, do, should we go? It would help you a lot if you did not associate with voting for the president as simply racist. We are authors. We are writers. We make our life and our story out of understanding people who are different than us. At least that's what I do. You can look at people that you don't agree with, and you should try to understand them, not assume that they're evil. But one of the problems here, especially with Twitter and especially with these people, is they see something they don't agree with and they instantly mark you as a villain and if you are a villain in their mind you're never allowed to be anything you're not a human anymore it's de it's complete dehumanization think of um the cases that i heard about recently with the rita awards and how they said certain people said that no care certain characters don't deserve a happy ending so like if you have a character who they deem is racist they don't even have to be racist for real but if they deem a character racist that character does not deserve a happy ending you cannot write a happy good story for a character they deem is a bad guy what like if that's what you want to write fine but how boring and who gave you the authority to tell other people what they're allowed to write to dictate what other people are allowed to write or you chase them off because that is essentially what this is Miss Kelly responded, Damon, I think the last question you posted should be discussed with the attorney because I honestly believe there are antitrust implications if RWA denies membership. I am honestly not trying to sway things one way or another. I do worry about staff and committee members having to spend significant amounts of time dealing with complaints. Members have options. They can go, stay or go. Miss Jewell replied, I feel that RWA can't and should not police like that. What we can do is a process for members to lodge a complaint against other members. Sue is entitled to her beliefs, but she cannot, within the bounds of her RWA membership, if she had one, act in a discriminatory, harassing, etc. way to another member of an RW at an RWA event. This is so mind blowing to me. Is they're saying they're they're discussing the discrimination act discrim they're discussing discriminatory actions of of Sue Grimshaw if she were an RWA member, while completely ignoring the fact that what Courtney Milan is doing is harassment and discrimination and she is an RWA member like it's so backwards Sue Grimshaw didn't do anything but mind her own business and like some stuff that relates to her politically Courtney Milan went out of her way to name names and get a group a horde of people together to get her fired Sue Grimshaw did nothing how is it that they're sitting here talking about Sue Grimshaw's actions and not Courtney Milan's actions 
How is it that they're sitting here not talking about the actions of one of their members as opposed to talking about the actions, how they can punish somebody who's not even related to this organization? Miss Kelly closed out the exchange with, I agree that we should not police social media in order to take action against someone's political or other beliefs. My concern is the implication that RWA can and should do something to sue. We can bar her from future conferences if she did, in fact, deny to work with someone based on RWA's code of conduct for industry members. In my opinion, if complainants can supply proof of the reasons any industry professional denies someone an opportunity based on the author's race, color, ethnicity, national origin, age, gender, gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation, disability, and physical appearance, body size, or religion. They should be barred from participating at RWA, but some members are now expecting RWA to take immediate action to discipline members and industry professionals without proof or due process. And here, Allison Kelly is like the one voice of reason here members so courtney milan went and pulled together members who want rwa to take action against industry professionals unrelated to the rwa without proof or due process burn the witch without proving she's done anything that is what this is about Kelly continues, I don't think it would be RWA's job to do extensive research in order to determine motive or should RWA assume motive. Correct. Finally, over the rest of the week, no further discussion took place at the RWA about this and Miss Milan did not engage in further postings about Miss Grimshaw. Other authors, however, learned that Miss Grimshaw was an acquisition editor for a new independent publishing company, Glenfinian Publishing, owned by RWA member and author Susan Tisdale. Other authors contacted Miss Tisdale to express concern about Glenfinian working with Miss Grimshaw. You know, the touch of death. In the name of the touch of death. Yeah. We just went there. <laughs> on August 24th, 2019, Miss Tisdale posted a 12 minute video on her Twitter account. In her video, Miss Tisdale stated that Miss Grimshaw is no more a racist than I and described the controversy as involving expressions of political views. That's what I discovered on December 24th when I was asking questions and everybody just said, ugh, ugh, she liked a racist. Later that day, Miss Milan began posting on Twitter about Miss Tisdale. Quote, why is at Susan Tisdale gaslighting us? Nobody is saying Sue Grimshaw is a skinhead or a member of the KKK. Well, Damon Suede did mention KKK robes, so allude to them. They're saying that she was a gatekeeper who may have kept, who may have kept, mar may, keyword kept marginalized people out of stores and publishing deals. And if your video says that Sue is no more racist than you, you sound extremely racist. Nobody wants anyone to hate anyone. But like if someone used institutional power to discriminate on the basis of race, I don't think they should continue to have institutional power. And if your institution insists on giving that person institutional power, I hope your institution fails. And, like, if your line of accountability is calling for the annihilation of a group of people, but you don't have an issue with systemically excluding a race of people from bookstores and publishing contracts, then you are definitely a racist. And, like Susan Tisdale, is entitled to be a racist and to run her publishing house as a racist, but, you know, we're entitled to not read of or review your books because I hate racist books. I mean, Courtney Milan should just change her name, her, her occupation, from lawyer or writer to smear merchant because that's all that that was. It's how many times can I use the term racist to try to give somebody the kiss of death, which is what calling somebody racist is on Twitter. It's how you stir the pot. The following day on August 25th, Miss Milan posted further tweets directed at Miss Tisdale. Quote, Susan, these are answers you owe to the entire romance community. And <laughs> note, this is all happening because Susan didn't fire Sue. As soon as the mob came and went, um, um, Susan, do you know, do you know that your employee is a racist? You know, they're expecting that Susan didn't talk to Sue. They were expecting Susan to just fire Sue as well because they don't want Sue to ever work again for whatever reason, for leper, leper, it's political leprosy. So the next day, basically, Milan posts a, another thing at Susan, saying, you owe the romance industry, romance community answers. And I'm not only asking these, I'm not the only one asking these questions. This is not a personal disagreement that can be resolved behind closed doors with a handshake. Yeah, because you have to make it public. You could have called, you could have made it quiet, but you didn't want to because you don't have any power if you do it quietly. Because you don't have any power if you actually took this to court to sue somebody for discrimination. And you know that, don't you, Courtney? 
That's why you never tried to sue Sue Grimshaw for discrimination. Because you know you'd lose. I'd know you'd lose. And I'm not even a lawyer. Same day, Courtney Milan also posted a series of tweets about a novel by RWA member and author Catherine Lynn Davis, who also was an acquisition editor at Glenn Finney and Publishing. As we can see, Courtney Milan is going ballistic and targeting everybody because Sue is connected to Tisdale and Tisdale would not back down. So now it's just time to carpet bomb to give them all the political leprosy. So Courtney says, okay, so you know how Glenn Finney and Publishing has two editors listed on his webpage and we've been talking about Sue Grimshaw. Someone sent me a link to the book written by other author, edit, by other editor, Catherine Lynn Davis, and it is a effing racist mess. Miss Milan posted an image of the cover of Miss Davis's novel, Somewhere Lies the Moon, stating, here is the book. I didn't finish the sample. I didn't need to. <laughs> Talk about judging a book. This book is like a bingo card of, oh my gosh, did you really? Miss Milan stated that the heroine is an obligatory blue-eyed half-Chinese half woman and went on to post a series of screenshots and passages from the novel that she characterized as examples of standard racist tropes. Miss Milan provided mocking commentary on the excerpt's passages, e.g., did you know that Chinese people don't touch, not even friends and sisters, it's impolite, you know, and then she wrote, as a half-Chinese person with brown eyes, seriously, F this P.O.S., I've said this before and I'll say it again. Don't write books about how much a culture not your own sucks. Just don't. You're not going to get it right and you're going to sound like a freaking racist. Also, I dragged that book not to be mean, but be I bet you're a Sagittarius. <laughs> I al also, I dragged that book not to be mean, but because people writing S like this get women like me assaulted and harassed. I have a question, Courtney. Are you a Sagittarius? And so then finally, August 26th, with Milan carrying on with her campaign, whatever it is, RWA begins to address Courtney Milan's social media activity because they have to. On August 26th, 2019, Sue Grimshaw emailed RWA Deputy Execu Executive Director Carol Ritter about the social media criticisms of her. Quote, I need your advice about a situation that's been brewing over the last few weeks. There's a group of authors that seem to have an agenda. It started earlier this year, as you may know, with a few New York Times bestselling authors accused of being racist. And now the accusations are being flung on me. A small group of authors got very loud on Twitter deciding that I was not open-minded enough to acquire for my employer's publishing company. Their ridiculous claims and rationale ended up costing me my position at the company. I was very disappointed to have lost the job, but what is affecting me more is the hurtful lies of this group of ladies are spewing. The comments they are making are so far from the truth, it's defaming, and now they are even becoming more vile. Their lies and hateful talk is affecting another publishing house I'm working with, and have been working with since June. Glenn Finney and publishing Susan Tisdale. The author spearheading the hate toward myself and Susan's company is Courtney Milan, along with a handful of her followers. Please share your thoughts and suggestions. I'm not sure what can be what I can do at this point. So there's not even like anything really mean. If that's all that she said, and I have to assume that that's really what she said, since this is from uh, independent contracted, you know, investigation. There's nothing vitriolic there. In fact, that email is much less vitriolic and, accus and accusatory than anything Milan has posted in subsequent tweets. The following day, August 27th, Ms. Ritter replied, I would like to share it with my boss, Allison Kelly. She forwarded Ms. Grimshaw's email to RWA's corporate counsel. That day, Ms. Tisdale called RWA's office asking about options to seek redress for the social media comments criticizing her in Glenfinian publishing. Ms. Milan and Ms. Ritter told Ms. Tisdale that if she thought that there were violations of code of ethics that she should file a formal complaint. They directed her to RWA's webpage and... They directed her to RWA's page about the member code of ethics. They also told Ms. Tisdale that RWA could not take any action outside of ethics complaints process. Around this time, Ms. Davis also called RWA, and Ms. Kelly and Ms. Ritter had a similar conversation with her. Oh, look, here are like three people trying to solve this quietly. Meanwhile, Courtney Milan is trying to make a group of people and do this publicly because she doesn't want a quiet resolution. She wants public submission and control. And she derives all of her power by making this public. That same day, then-President Helen K. Diamond 
emailed Carolyn Jewell, whose term as president would begin in five days. Miss Diamond emailed copied Miss Kelly and Miss Ritter, quote, because we are not capable of having a quiet week in RWA, we have this issue. Courtney is chair of ethics committee. She has been on Twitter complaining about Sue Grimshaw and talking about how members should complain about her, etc. I'm paraphrasing, but the point is that we've had complaints. In general, complaints about not liking Courtney generally don't sway me, but I think we have a problem here. That's because they're both Sagittarius. They're all Sagittariuses. Let's... Helen Kay, Sarah McLean, Courtney Milan. Let's just bet that they're all Sagittarius's at this point. In the social media policy, we say, RWA directors, chapter officers, committee members, and task force members should understand that by virtue of their leadership positions, their communications might be perceived by third parties as being made on behalf of RWA. While RWA embraces freedom of communication, that freedom must be balanced against one's duties to RWA. As ethics chair, I do think that we have potential perception problem and an issue with this Courtney speaking on ethics-related issues in this way. I think we need to write to her, advise her in this section, and spell out the concerns. The problem, of course is timing whatever happens if courtney wants to apologize or step down or whatever will likely fall under your presidency do you have a preference or thoughts on how to proceed i don't want to launch a grenade and then have it explode on you during the first few days of your being president and then you get stuck with it and kelly miss kelly prompted re promptly replied fyi the complaints continued and authors are alleging defamation and injury of their careers which is provable with sue grimshaw losing her job, and Glenn Finian losing some book deals. Miss Jewell suggested notifying Miss Milan that RWA is worried about that current, current discussions about the Sue G matter, which has spiraled to at least one other author are running afoul of the policy on use of social media by committee members. Miss Ritter emailed the group to alert them at, that she and Miss Kelly are on the phone with RWA's corporate counsel and that she thinks RWA is at risk because Courtney has an official capacity with the RWA. That evening, Miss Tisdale submitted a formal ethics complaint against Miss Milan. The next day, Miss Diamond, Miss Jewell, Miss Kelly, and Miss Ritter continued their discussions about how to address Miss Milan's role in the Ethics Committee chair and continued to consult with corporate counsel about what procedural steps to pursue. In an email on August 28th, corporate counsel advised, I think that you I think you're going to have no choice but to proceed with ethics complaints against Miss Milan. Later that day, he reiterated, I believe RWA needs to act on this complaint here, a temporary chair of the ethics committee will need to be appointed as Courtney will need to recuse herself from the committee's proceedings. RWA did not engage in any further cons consultation with corporate counsel relating to the ethics complaints against Miss Milan between end of August 2019 and December 26, 2019, after Miss Jewell resigned as president. The following day on August 29th, Miss Diamond emailed Miss Milan asking her to step down. The following day on August 29th, Miss Diamond emailed Miss Milan asking her to step down as ethics chair. Fifteen minutes later, Milan responded offering her resignation. And after that, Allison Kelly apparently had no further interaction with this or no further power over this. She just sent the, the, image, the um, emails out to the people who are going to be taking it over. And to Courtney because, you know, the accused gets a, a thing of their own. That accused gets to see what they're being accused of. And of course, August 31st, Miss Milan emailed both Diamond and Jewel saying, I hereby disagree with these claims for the record. We get down here to Ethics Committee Review on the Tisdale Davis Complaints. RWA established a confidential ethics committee loop for the panel reviewing the complaints against Miss Milan and the members of the committee were all required to sign a combined confidentiality and conflict of interest form. On October 21st, 2019, Miss Ritter uploaded the Tisdale Davis Complaints, Miss Milan's responses, and all supporting documentation to the Ethics Committee Dropbox folder with a link provided on the ethics committee forum miss milan responded to tisdale's complaint included a reference to miss jewel quote public attention first first came to sue grimshaw's matter on august 7th 2019 when carol jewel tweeted as follows quote, well i saw that someone who's been years in the publishing not writing business likely a highly problematic tweet and went liked a highly problematic tweet and when i checked if that was on accident their timeline was full of likes of hateful racist tweets sorry but blocked That just means Trump tweets. At this day and age, it just means conservative tweets. 
I'm so sick of the political faction, specifically on the political left, that everything, if you disagree with them, you are a racist, you are a phobe, you are some kind of ism, because it's a purity test of you fall in line with them or you are an ist and evil and blah. And they don't give any evidence, they just label you and then tell you, tell everybody that you are this thing, and it's over. Then they try to destroy your life. If we could just disagree and not try to destroy each other's lives, that would be great, really. That would be awesome. Shortly after reviewing Ms. Milan's response, Ms. Jewell notified Mr. Suede and Ritter Ethics Committee Chair that she had decided to recuse herself. Mr. Suede had not previously been aware of formal ethics complaints had been filed against Ms. Milan. Jewell did not participate in any further matters in the ethics committee panels. On November 1st, however, the chair posted a question to the committee, quote, are we all satisfied with the information that has been provided or do we have, do we wish to have additional documentation is there anything we already have that needs clarification that we already have that needs clarification one committee member said in terms of info i would like to know if everyone who can view this committee's posts is required to sign the confidentiality agreement we received in other words can the other board members review the posts or members of the staff and if so do they first have to sign the agreement this kind of kind of makes me feel like, somebody's trying to see if they can give somebody some information to start going to building a public case, like on Twitter. As far as information regarding this complaint, I believe I have what I need already and do not need more. It seems to me that considering the board did exclude social media for whatever reason, in doing so, they pretty much gutted the provision of the ethics policies that has to do with harming other other members' business, career, etc. I'm not sure why we even have that clause now. So this is saying that what Courtney did was damaging, but because RWA has a clause excluding social media behavior they don't need a meet for it so it's damning to courtney's behavior and it's also damning to the rwa not being prepared for this kind of thing and or for excluding this kind of thing from judgment and then that is going to reflect on the rwa poorly because they allow this in their provisions they allow abuse and harassment on social media in their provisions in their ethical provisions the panel discussed the allegations in the complaint in accordance with each alleged violation of the code as well as whole. The committee reviewed no evidence other than the documents in the Tisdale and Davis complaints, Miss Milan's responses, and supporting exhibits, which they discussed in light of the policy violations that each complainant had asserted. The evidence consisted of extensive social media posts by Miss Milan and others critical of Sue Grimshaw's social media commentary and actions as a buyer of four borders to the alleged detriment of authors of color and authors of romance novels that depicted diverse characters. Susan Tisdale's response to the Grimshaw concerns, in particular to the content of her defense of Mrs. Grim of Miss Grimshaw and Glenn Finney in publishing and depictions of Chinese characters in Catherine Lynn Davis's novel Somewhere Lies the Moon. The tone of Miss Milan's posts was inflammatory, suggesting that both Miss Tisdale and Miss David sound racist suggesting that both Miss Tisdale and Miss Davis sound racist in posts that include swear words and referring to Miss Davis's novel as shit, as well as stating that Glenn Finney's publishing that I hope your institution fails. And you'll see at other points that Milan was going, I didn't call either of these people racist. I said the book was racist. No, she went up there and said, no, Sue Grimshaw is racist. And if you say you're as racist as Sue Grimshaw or Sue Grimshaw is as racist as you are, then that sounds like you're pretty freaking racist and you run a racist institution and I hope your institution fails. So Courtney Milan did straight up call all of these people racist, not just a book. Assert assertion, more evidence, assertions by Miss Davis and Miss Tisdale that each had suffered a business injury as a result of the attacks and negative attention on social media. Miss Davis asserted that because of Miss Milan's cyberbullying, I lost three book contracts that had been promised to me with a publisher whom I cannot name because of fear of having their name linked to Miss Milan's. Miss Tisdale asserted that she lost three of my Glenfinian authors not because they agreed with Miss Milan and those of their ilk, but because they were afraid of any backlash from Miss Milan, that if Miss Milan starts attacking them, they will lose future contract sales, contracts and sales. These attacks are costing us potential income. Again, it's the kiss of death, it's leprosy, only on Twitter. Note, remember the Twitter statistics that I keep talking about. It is not real life, and the loudest people like Miss Milan are not the majority. However, for some reason, people will treat them like they are and allow them to ruin people's lives. It's not a good business move. Do not let Courtney Milan and people like her control you. 
More evidence. Assertions by Ms. Tisdale and Ms. Davis that Ms. Milan's leadership role with RWA when she had made those posts exacerbated the harm they experienced. Ms. Davis wrote that Ms. Milan is a well-known voice for RWA, particularly for the Ethics Committee, and in regards to the questions of diversity. Through cyber attacks such as this one, she is increasing public awareness in a very negative way, harming me and many others and making it more difficult for us to earn a living as full-time writers. Ms. Davis asked that Ms. Milan cannot be allowed to hold a position of authority or to use her voice to urge others to follow her lead. Ms. Tisdale argued that it was wrong for Miss Milan to be the chair of RWA Ethics Committee when she continually and repeatedly behaves in a manner and launches discussing attacks against other authors of an RWA members. Because Miss Milan helped put into the code ethics, what happens on Twitter stays on Twitter. She is allowed to bully innocent people unchecked and unrestrained. Miss Milan is not what the face of RWA needs to be. That would be interesting if she had a, a hand in what counted as um, online appropriate behavior and then went and violated it because she helped make the rules. She's a lawyer. She knows what she's allowed to do. And you can't get her for it. Very interesting. Exchanges between Miss Milan and Miss David via Twitter. These messages were not included in either Tisdale or Davis's complaint. Rather, Miss Milan had included screenshots of the messages in her response to Tisdale's complaints. The an exchange related to Miss Milan posing questions about Glenfinian process of selecting manuscripts and whether the company had published authors of color. Miss Milan then made public posts commenting critically on Tisdale's responses to those questions, which was just that they hadn't published anybody yet, mind you. Evidence from Miss Milan that many other individuals had engaged in similar social media criticisms of Miss Tisdale and Miss Davis's novel doesn't make it appropriate if you have formed a mob or joined a mob well they did it so i so i can't be held accountable mm, honey especially not when you hold a position of power in addition to the evidence miss milan's submissions advanced argument against the allegations that her co that her conduct violated the code in pertinent part her arguments included the assertions that she did not violate rwa's anti-discrimination policy as set out quote a violation of this provision requires me to have discriminated against miss davis because of her race no, there were a lot of other classes, but I digress. Discussing how I believe all authors should write characters of a certain race is not discrimination of the basis of race. Yeah, it is, because you're saying all authors should write this certain way if they're a certain race. You're setting racial rules, Courtney. The way I responded to her had nothing to do with her whiteness. Yes, it did, because you would not, you used, you specifically used, she's, Courtney specifically used the response of me being a half Asian woman, being a half Chinese woman, know this better than you. You being a white woman, don't know this. You being a white woman, can't write this. Me being a half Chinese person, knows better than you. Do as I say. She completely outlined this in a, in a racial way, making it racist. Like that was one of her excuses for why she was allowed to dictate to Catherine. She made her own case against herself here. And everything to do with the fact that I believed her book was harmful. I believe that writers should write about marginalized people with care and respect and be aware that they have the potential to do harm. You, and you're assuming that she didn't write with care and respect right here because she didn't write them how you would because of her race, as you assumed. A rejection of Miss Davis's defense that her book is historically accurate and the assertion that Quote, the tweet Miss Tisdale highlights are discussions of the business practices discussing the character and content of several editors who are selling services to authors as independent editors and who are the editors of record for a publisher that publishes authors is a business discussion. Tisdale also references that my commentary on a book, which is clearly an honest discussion. No, it's not clearly. It's clearly an honest discussion. This racist piece of trash. That is not an honest discussion, Miss Milan. And an assertion that she did not engage in conduct injurious to the RWA. Nah, yeah, don't worry about it. She will always claim that she is not at all. She is not at all the aggressor ever, ever. If you go down to page 34, it talks about the initial decision that the board took against Courtney Milan, and they did find her in violation of the code of conduct, and the decision was rescinded Originally, they put sanctions on Courtney, saying that she could no longer hold position, po positions of power within the organization. And I think they, 
like lifetime. And I think they put a like one year ban on her joining the RWA or being a member of the RWA. Um, and then after Christmas break, they took that all back and changed their decision and decided she was not guilty. And all I can assume is that that came because of all of the pressure. There was so much noise, so much noise about this. Mr. Swade told Pillsbury how he described the information to the board. I explained that the ethics panel had reviewed materials that wasn't visible online and that the private communications had played a factor. One board member asked again if the evidence involved discussions that wasn't held on a public on social media. I confirmed that was so. I also pointed out that the panel had expressed repeatedly a strong hope that the board would deal with the social media loophole because th that exception in the harassment policy had left their hands tied. So this is the main issue. What we're going to what we're going to take away from this specifically is Courtney Milan was not deemed guilty anymore of improper behavior because this all took place on social media and she specifically worked with what was it helen k diamond to sort of craft the new rules which included social media policy and they said they could not be held accountable for anything posted on personal social media accounts this completely cleared courtney milan to do anything and everything she wanted from her personal account which includes harassing people she doesn't like and then getting away with it she's a lawyer and that's what they're saying here is that with how the policies have been written, which Courtney had a hand in, they could not punish her by holding her by because the policies allowed what Courtney did. Courtney also made sure that all of this happened on social media. She did not talk to Susan Tisdale, Sue Grimshaw, or Catherine Lynn Davis personally. She did not phone call with any of them about this. She did not email any of them about this. She did not personally talk to any of them about this because it all counts as social media interactions which has a loophole in the code of ethics, which means Courtney Milan did nothing wrong. Continuing with Swade's words, the committee stated plainly multiple times that Milan's behavior was so abusive and egregious that any professional organization should have policy in place to protect members, especially from its leaders. I pointed the directors to that explicit concern in the report. I spoke in geniality about the discussions and the panel's concerns about the hostile workplace. Board members asked me to explain the logic of the ruling, and I compared it to coming into an office where you are threatened, harassed, and attacked every day by the people in authority. Several board members told Pillsbury that Mr. Swade stated that Miss Milan's behavior was analogous to the boss repeatedly whipping his penis out. So the big takeaway here is that there was no specific definitions for these things and that what Miss Milan was doing, she specifically had created a loophole for herself or had assistance in creating a loophole for herself so that she could target people from a position of power and not get in trouble for it. And then if she got in trouble for it, she could point out, well, it's not in the rules and now I'm being mistreated. There's a whole, if you want to read the, about the aftermath of all of this stuff, please click the link, the link in the description below. This video is getting so long, so I do want to get to the end of how this all happened again obviously at the end the board rescinded its findings against miss milan because there were loopholes most of the rwa's leadership has resigned and i don't blame them because there was a mob but this also leaves a giant hole for activists to come in and fill those slots and drastically radically transform what the organization is if you thought it was bad before when they just held a couple of spots think of it if they all come in all at once so now is the time to really decide if this is something that needs to be saved or if you need to start over because they are going to go in. Surfing the Twitter, there are a bunch of people who believe in the die stuff that are saying they're going to go and fill the holes. So they are running for office and they want to take those places and they want to push this harder and change the rules for their benefit, not for the fairness, but to push their ideas. What really needs to happen here for RWA to recover is they need, one, to not play favoritism, to not make special rules for any protected classes, because that's what's happening right now with the die stuff. Again, it's not a political pact. This is a romance thing. This is a romance writing organization. So everybody going in, regardless of class or group that you belong to, should be going in as an equal with equal opportunities, equal attention, equal class, and you fight it out. Not special anything. And when you have classes specifically devoted to identity issues, you're getting special treatment. The other thing that RWA really needs to do if they want to survive is they need to clean up their code of ethics and get rid of these loopholes for harassment. 
But I think the big thing that really happened was they had people in there who were not the best people for those positions who created rules so they knew how to break them. That's what that's my big takeaway from this. And um, Twitter sucks. But uh, I know this video was long, so thank you for sticking with it sticking with me this whole entire way if you did uh if you have further comments on the situation on the ethics reports please let me know in the comments down below i ha i love hearing from you guys i love having the conversation and getting more insight or ideas anything that i've missed uh if you want to read over the audit itself it's going to be linked in the description below and i look forward to seeing you next time talk <laughs> For the record, they did leave suggestions at the bottom of this thing for how to fix, for, you know, the legal ways of fixing the RWA documentation, and they're worth looking at. But there's, that's really the biggest issue. Don't have people that look forward to breaking the rules make the rules.